Yiddish language and literature, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, really happy to see people here for this talk, which is, you know, it's not klezmer, it's not uh, uh, Yiddish theater or any, you know, anything in the entertaining business. <laughs> um, what I'm, I'm um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about um, the history of Yiddish language and literature, that's a sort of a big title, but uh, it'll really be just a brief overview of a very complex and, and very rich subject. <coughs> but um, before, I, before I actually start my talk, I, I feel like I want to say a few words to commemorate the life and work of, the, of Avram Suskaveh, um, the greatest Yiddish poet of the last 50 years who was uh, born in Vilna in 1913 and uh, died in Tel Aviv last month, a little uh, less than a month ago. Sutzkever's life really uh, encompasses the European Jewish and the Yiddish experience of the 20th century. He began, publishing, he began writing and publishing poetry in Vilna in the 1930s. Uh, he was immediately recognized as a major creative voice. He survived the war in the Vilna ghetto um, he, he continued to write there and to initiate cultural activities. Um, best known, perhaps, is that he was part of a small group that hid the archival materials of Yivo, the center of Jewish scholarship that was founded in Vilna. Uh, and he, uh, they were later able to retrieve these archival materials. When the ghetto was liquidated, uh, Suskaver and his wife uh, escaped and joined the Russian partisans. And um, at at the um, request of some uh, major Soviet writers, Jewish writers and others, um, he, uh, Suskova and his wife were airlifted to Moscow out of the forest, and that's really a very unusual uh, event. He testified at the Nuremberg trials in 1946. He immigrated to then Palestine in 1947. In Israel, he founded and edited uh, a quarterly magazine of literature and criticism um, titled The Golden Akate, The Golden Chain, and that of course uh, speaks to the tradition that uh, Jewish culture is handed down <coughs> from one generation to the next, forming a sort of golden chain. So The Golden Akate was the most important post-war Yiddish magazine. Uh, he was really the life and soul of this quarterly. In 1998, when he couldn't edit it any longer, it closed down and there's no replacement. Uh, Suskever was a magnificent lyric poet who never stopped writing and constantly renewed himself. Um, his poetry has been widely translated into many languages. And um, I'd like to read a, a poem that he wrote, a short poem that he wrote in Israel in 1974, uh, long after the end of the war. But this poem sort of expresses his poetic credo in the midst of horrors that we can't begin to imagine. And it, it, it's titled, it goes by the, uh, by the first line. Um, I'll read it in English first and then in Yiddish. Maybe the other way around. Yiddish. I like the Yiddish. We'll start with Yiddish, okay. Well, if you read in English first, then... then it'll, it'll be easier there. for people to follow. So, okay, so it's, uh, who will remain? What will remain? It's a very well-known poem. It's available on the internet, by the way, in his own reading. Uh, so uh, here's a translation. It's mine, more or less. Who will remain? What will remain? A wind will remain. The blindness will remain of the blind man who is gone. A sign of the sea will remain. A string of foam. A cloudlet tangled in a tree. Who will remain? What will remain? A primeval syllable will remain and sprout for new creation. A fiddle rose honoring herself will remain. Seven blades of grass will understand her. Of all the stars from north to here, the one that landed in mid-tier will remain. A drop of wine will always remain in its jug. Who will remain? God will remain. Isn't that enough for you? And the Yiddish. Wer wird bleiben? Was wird bleiben? 
Wer wird bleiben? Was wird bleiben? Bleiben wird der Wind. Bleiben wird die Blindheit von einem Blinden, was verschwindet. Bleiben wird der Simmen von einem Jam, der Schnee schäumt. Bleiben wird der Wolkenlo, der Schäppet auf Bäumen. Wer wird bleiben? Was wird bleiben? Bleiben wird der Traf, brech ist dicker, reust du großen, wieder den Beschaff. Bleiben wird der Fiedelreus, le Covet sich allein. Sieben Großen von die Großen wollen sie verstehen. Mehr von alle Sternen, als von Zoffen bis daher, bleiben wird der Stern, wo er fällt in Sametrer. Ständig wird der Tropfen Wein euch bleiben in sein Krug. Wer wird bleiben? Gott wird bleiben. Ist der nicht genug? So I'll turn to the official topic of this talk, which is the history of Yiddish language and literature. Um, I'd like to start. Here. There are some chairs in the staff lounge, which otherwise is empty. And what I'm thinking is maybe we can all. Yeah, you can uh, all. Right. Right. Come on there. We can make room. Here, why don't you give me that I actually, I have a, a handout sheet here that I'll hand out at the end of uh, the names of some of the writers I'm going to be mentioning. Um, so, um, Okay, so this is going to be sort of an overview of Yiddish uh, language and literature, which is very complex, very rich subject, as you all know. Um, now, the, the, lang the Yiddish language is a Germanic language. And, and uh, by the way, I know I'm going to be saying things that some of you know and others of you might not be familiar with. And so, um, you know, it's sort of uh, uh, pretty inclusive. So Yiddish is a Germanic language, and um, it's spoken by, the last count, about four million Jews throughout the world. Uh, the name Yiddish itself is an adjective that means Jewish. Um, and uh, in old, uh, an older English term for this language is uh, Judeo-German, which sort of makes it sound more scientific, <laughs> uh, more academic, maybe. Um, Yiddish is written in Hebrew characters. And this is true of all the Jewish languages, um, Judeo-Arabic, uh, Judeo-Spanish, which is also known as Ladino, Judeo-Persian. All these lo local languages are all written in Hebrew characters. Yiddish started developing around the year 1000, as, as best we can make out, in the cities of the Middle Rhine region. And early Yiddish was a, an amalgam of Middle High German dialects. Middle High German was a phase in the development of German that has disappeared from German. And actually, I've had students coming to learn Yiddish, uh, um, ger students of, of, ger of German linguistics, who come to learn Yiddish because Yiddish preserves features of Middle High German that are no longer available in German. Um, so early Yiddish um, had used these Middle High German dialects. It also uh, borrowed from the Romance languages that grew out of Latin, such as uh, so French and Italian. We have some Latin elements. Um, and of course, the Hebrew and Aramaic terms that are part of Jewish ritual. In the 10th century, Ashkenazi Jews, Ashkenazi is the term, the Hebrew term for loosely Germany, in the 10th century, Ashkenazi Jews began to migrate uh, mostly eastward, and they formed communities in Poland, Austria, Eastern Europe, and further east. And they brought their language with them and added Slavic components to it. So we have, in Yiddish, elements of all these different uh, cultures and languages. Yiddish was the language um, that Jews used for all forms of oral communication. It was used in education, uh, debate, preaching, legal advice, trade, storytelling, and it became the common language of Jews all over Europe in, in spite of the dialectal differences. We all know about the Galicianos and the Litvaks, 
and their sub-dialects, but it's in, the important thing to remember is that the dialectal differences are only in pronunciation and not in spelling. Um, and so it was possible a Jew from Galicia could understand a Jew from Ukraine and, and vice versa. Um, Yiddish was spoken in an area that was, um, it's considered the, the second largest territorial expanse of any language or culture in Europe. Russian was spoken over the largest area. Yiddish was spoken over the second largest area in Europe. And so this non-physical territory is often called Yiddishland. <laughs> and there are different definitions of Yiddishland, but very generally it's defined as every place where Yiddish is spoken is Yiddishland. Um, now, Yiddish is what's known as a fusion language. And that is defined by linguists as a language that incorporates se elements from several linguistic sources, but each element remains distinct and is recognizable. But the basic requirement of Yiddish is that the frame and the structure of the sentence has to be Germanic. So you can plug in Slavic and Hebraic elements or English elements, but the, they have to uh, fit into the Germanic uh, morphology, syntax, and uh, most, of, most of the vocabulary, in fact, is Germanic. Um, the German elements came into Yiddish from various regions and periods. Uh, German suffixes, such as plural <laughs> suffixes, are attached to roots from other sources, usually not to Hebraic roots, although there are uh, exceptions to that. The different languages that make up Yiddish play different roles in everyday life. And now Yiddish is often described as a rich language, although the vocabulary is not that big. And part of its richness, so-called, is explained by the fact that the speakers can play off the di different contexts of idioms and phrases. Um, all these expressions and the contexts are familiar to the listeners, so the listeners are able to grasp and appreciate the different nuances. Yiddish writers were very sensitive to the interaction between the linguistic elements. They used it as a source of semantic and stylistic variety and impact. If you, you wanted to reproduce the speak of a, of a uh, Ukrainian peasant, you used one kind of Yiddish, and if you wanted to reproduce the speech of a, uh, of a Jewish scholar, you used other idioms and expressions. Um, now the Yiddish term for for Hebra for Hebrew, it's not act it's not only Hebrew; it's all the layers of Hebrew and Aramaic. The Yiddish term for that is loshen kodesh, literally the holy tongue, and that refers to all the um, Hebraic and Aramaic terms. And very often, it um, it's used for a higher register or an elevated topic. So Yiddish. Um, uses the Hebraic word sefer for a book dealing with sacred matters, a Yiddish book on se or a Hebrew book dealing with uh, ritual or religious matters is always called a sefer. An ordinary book uses the Germanic buch. And so when, when um, um, Sholom uh, Yankiv Abramovich takes, the, the great writer takes the, the uh, pen name Mendele Moichel Sforim, he's a seller of Sforim, which is the Hebraic plural for Sefer. He's an itinerant peddler, but not of uh, everyday books, but of Sforim, and that's very significant. The, the Yiddish reader immediately gets the difference. The pronunciation and meaning of Hebrew words often differ from that of the same word in uh, Biblical Hebrew and modern spoken Hebrew. But the crucial component of Yiddish that makes it a Jewish language, so to speak, is the Hebrew, the Hebraic element. There have been, by the way, unsuccessful attempts to write Yiddish in a Latin alphabet. Never, never caught on. Yiddish conversation typically borrows expressions from other languages and even incorporates uh, bits of uh, speech from other languages. Uh, Benjamin Harshav, uh, great scholar who some of us know personally and others, uh, we've, we've read his books. Harshav says, um, 
in Yiddish, you can speak five languages in one and the same sentence. <laughs> and uh, if you start thinking of Yiddish sentences or, uh, you know, bits of, of dialogue, you see that that's very true. So, be, uh, because of this uh, linguistic fluidity, which seems to make Yiddish a language of many languages, but maybe not a true language, it was often termed a jargon. Um, which sometimes means, you know, a, a vocabulary, a language specific to a certain discipline or to a certain science, but generally it's pretty pejorative. Oh, that's not a real language, it's a jargon. Um, and this uh, pejorative term was so wi widespread that Jews even internalized it, and they often referred to their own language as jargon. And you find that on the masthead of uh, newspapers uh, at the turn of the 20th century. The Yiddish spoken in one country included components of the local language that was absent from the Yiddish spoken in another country. So the, mass, uh, so the Jews who immigrated to the United States at the turn of the 20th century uh, made the, uh, Americanized the language, and so words like kitchen and college <laughs> made it into a Yiddish English dictionary of 1928. There's a supplement in the Halkavi uh, 1928 uh, Yiddish English Hebrew Dictionary. There's a supplement of uh, modern words, and most of those are adapted from American English. Uh, Yiddish speakers in the Soviet Union use a large pr proportion of Russian. Uh, the Yiddish in Latin America has a lot of Spanish, and so on. And so Yiddish is very open to enrichment and its native speakers can enrich its vocabulary whenever this is necessary, but the basic core of Yiddish really is the Germanic structural system of grammar and syntax and the Hebraic component. The earliest Yiddish printed text is found in a Hebrew prayer book of uh, 1272. Uh, it's, a, it's a Hebrew prayer book, but there's a short Yiddish rhyme that's inscribed into the Hebrew text in that book. Old Yiddish literature, about to the end of the 18th century, uh, consisted mainly of uh, devotional works designed to make religion accessible to everyone. Because Yiddish was the spoken language, women could read Yiddish, whereas many of them couldn't read Hebrew. And so Yiddish made that whole sphere accessible to everyone. Uh, in the mid-14th century, uh, there began to appear rhyme adaptations of some biblical tales. There's something called the, the Shmuel Buch uh, and others. At the end of the 17th century, Yiddish biblical dramas began to appear uh, based on uh, the story of David and Goliath, the selling of Joseph, the Purim story that we know that de later developed into the Purim Spiel. Mm -hmm. uh, Yiddish religious writing consisted mainly of translations of prayers from the Hebrew, but there was a unique genre of uh, uh, prayers which were considered prayers for women, and they, uh, they are known as trinis, supplications. And these um, started developing in the 16th century. They were so popular that they have never gone out of print. Um, Yiddish-speaking uh, women in the ultra-Orthodox communities uh, are never far from their uh, uh, little book of trinis. Um, ethical writings and fables were translated from Hebrew. Now, there was one very interesting exception. In northern Italy in the 16th century, Jews who immigrated from Germany and held on to the language published, started publishing some secular Yiddish literature in northern Italy. Secular, in quote marks, it's not secular as we understand it today, but it was not religious writing, per se. And so those Yiddish works are um, original, but they were influenced by popular Italian stories of the time. And uh, you might be familiar with the Bova Buch, uh, written by Elijah Levita, uh, also known as Elia Bochel. He had several, uh, was known by several names. That's an adaptation of an Italian tale about the a knight of Antona named Bove, Bove d'Antona. And so it was adapted into Yiddish and became very popular. In the 19th and early 20th, 20th centuries, Yiddish became a mass vehicle for modernization because it was accessible to everyone. And it was used as such by the Enlightenment movement 
the Haskole, the Haskalah, and that the period of that is uh, late 18th to late 19th century, about 100 years. During that time, a widespread system of Yiddish um, secular schools, from kindergarten through high school, developed all over Eastern Europe. Hundreds of Yiddish newspapers and periodicals began to appear. Yiddish libraries um, were opened in Jewish neighborhoods. At the start of the 20th century, Yiddish uh, was really emerging as a major Eastern European language. A rich literature was being published. Yiddish theater and film were booming. It had even achieved status as one of the official languages of the Belarusian SSR. Many Jews in Eastern Europe who rejected Zionism and, and wanted a sort of a Jewish cultural autonomy in Europe considered Yiddish the national language and turned themselves Yiddishists. And that was the subject of much debate at the, what was optimistically called, the first Yiddish language conference in Chernovitz in 1908. We just marked the 100th anniversary, as it turned out to be the only uh, international Yiddish conference. Uh, Yiddish language conference, but there was a lot of discussion whether Yiddish should be, um, whether it should, there should be a re resolution designating Yiddish as the language or the Jew of the Jewish people or a language of the Jewish people. And um, so that resolution never made it through. Um, the Jews who immigrated to the Americas brought their Jewish culture with them, and so centers of Yiddish culture were established by Jewish immigrants to Mexico and Argentina, especially, but also in other parts of, uh, of uh, South America. <coughs> but uh, the worldwide trend of assimilation, every immigrant wants to assimilate. I mean, what you want for your kids is to, to become part of the local culture, uh, and so that was an inevitable process. Um, and so in the United States, most Jewish speakers did not pass on the language to their children. In fact, they encouraged them to use English exclusively. You know, you shouldn't be considered a green. Don't use Yiddish. And then the destruction of, the, of Europe's Jewish community really obliterated that culture. Yiddish does continue to thrive in the ultra-Orthodox Jewish communities of the world. Um, Yiddish is the everyday language. There, these communities have a flourishing Yiddish literature that is staunchly, actively engaged in a struggle against secularism. So there is a Yiddish literature, but it's not, uh, not what we're familiar with from uh, interwar Europe or from, you know, 19, late 19th century Europe. So um, I'm going to turn to uh, modern Yiddish literature. And um, of course, again, I, uh, I want to say that I'm, talk I'm going to be talking about secular Yiddish literature, the literature that developed in Europe and in the United States and in other places um, from the beginning, from the turn of the 19th century. Um, the late 19th and early 20th centuries are considered the golden age of Yiddish literature. This, by the way, this period also coincides with the revival of Hebrew as a spoken language and the development of a secular Hebrew literature. And um, that the Hebrew literature developed first in Europe and later in what was then Palestine. The late 19th century was the time when the three great founders of modern Yiddish literature were active. These are known as the classic writers, the three classic writers, the drei classicals. And they are, of course, in, in chronological order, Mendele Moichos Forim, Sholem Aleichem, and Yitzchok Leibush Peretz. Now, it's interesting that all three of these writers began their literary careers in Hebrew. It was, uh, that was uh, sort of um, the result of, of because, of, because Hebrew was the more prestigious language in the culture. It was the language of scholarship, um, and so it was better, it was considered more prestigious to start writing in Hebrew, but there was no readership in Hebrew. Very few people read Hebrew. And so these, these three writers and many others switched to Yiddish 
Uh, Mendelina Fosfolin, by the way, later retranslated or reworked the, the um, uh, things that he had originally published in Hebrew and then translated or reworked into Yiddish, reworked a third time back into Hebrew. And so people really uh, were very, there was a lot of fluidity between the languages. People were at home uh, in, in both languages and, and cultures. Now, was there Yiddish spelling before this time, since it was mainly a vocal language? There is, yeah. Um, Yiddish is, is phonetic. There are no, <coughs> no vowel signs, no, no nikudot, no nikudis, no, none of the vowel signs that come underneath the letters as are in Hebrew. So Yiddish is phonetic, and it was spelled phonetically from the very start. There were different types of phonetic spellings, and all of those were standardized, or at least uh, the, the ideal was to standardize them, and that's what one of the things that Gimbel, the, um, the Jewish uh, Scientific Research Institute, uh, started um, in, the, in the 20s and 30s. And so when uh, people who learn Yiddish now uh, in universities or um, in other places learn the standard Yiddish, the Klal Yiddish that was established by Yivo. And so there's, the spelling has been standardized, but there always was a Yiddish spelling that incorporated a lot of uh, um, vowel sounds, but not the symbols. So did people who spoke different dialects write, use different vowels in, when they no. wrote Yiddish? No, no, the writing um, so they would write things wrong, that would I be think different from how they said them? Very often it was. For instance, um, well, one of the famous, exam uh, famous uh, uh, examples is the, the word, the Germanic word for butter, uh, which in, in the uh, Litvak dialect, which is the basis of Klal Yiddish, is putel, and in other places, in Poland, in Romania, it's pitel. But it's always written with the u. The u can be pronounced as an e. Mm -hmm. But in writing, it's always u. I guess the only difference would have been the Soviet Yiddish, which actually put the, the, the letters for vowels in, in the spelling. That, or the that, Hebraic yeah. um, Hebrew words. No, the Hebraic... Um, the, the Soviet, Soviet Yiddish was a very interesting episode that, uh, that tried to eliminate every trace of connection with Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And okay. so the words that were traditionally written, the Hebrew words, the Hebraic words that preserved their Hebrew spelling, such as, uh, say, Shabbos. We say Shabbos, but it's written Shin Beis Tov. That's the Hebraic spelling. With no vowels. With no vowels. Uh, you know, of course, you know the vowels. Yeah. But the Soviet orthography had that shin aleph base ayin samich, which is, um, it's funny, but it's really pretty sad. Sad. That to, see, to see those words just oh, so completely warped and, <laughs> and, you know, twisted out of shape. Okay. So that lasted for a few decades, and I think it was, um, they, they um, started reverting back to the traditional Yiddish writing uh, I think sometime in the 70s. And in fact, there's a, there's a glossary, there's a dictionary of Soviet Yiddish orthography, Soviet Yiddish words, uh, and what their real Hebrew equivalents are. A okay, cousin who, I guess, uh, immigrated from the Soviet Union to Israel in 95 still writes me with, you know, putting in far too many vowel, actual vowel <laughs> right. letters. In yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. So that, that's what he learned. Yeah. Uh, for instance, they did away with the final letters. There's right. no final yeah. noon or final say. And that is so strange. <laughs> it's very, yes, it's, it's very odd. Since, since we're on the subject, yeah. just the, you know, the primers that they use in the, in the Hasidic community do have the nekudot to teach the little kids. That's right. Um, but that an ayin is pronounced eh. Yeah. And they have three dots under them. I and always found that very interesting. <laughs> you go into a religious orthodox uh, bookstore, and you look for Yiddish books, and the ones for children all have the Nikudot. Well, that's, that's signs of the times, because even the, the Orthodox communities are also <coughs> not quite what they were in Europe 80 years ago. 
<coughs> so um, there, there's a need for that. Yes, that, that is a very interesting. No, but also in the 19th century, you see a lot of Yiddish with Nikud. With full Nikud? Full Nikud. I in with the Segal of the 19th hmm. century. So there, yeah, so as, as people uh, started being aware of outside influences or being more influenced by them, they needed uh, that kind of reinforcement. Um, so I'm, I'm going to give um, sort of brief notes on, on a bunch of writers. And um, I, have, I have a handout here with the names and dates and, and genres these writers wrote in. Uh, and I'm not even going to be mentioning all of them. And this is a very, very partial and very uh, selective list um, that I, I, there's no hidden agenda in this list. It's just, uh, you know, just the names that came to, first names that came to mind. Um, so we start with Mendel and Moichel's Forum, um, who is the, the um, pen name um, of Sholem Yanke Vabramovich, and his dates are 1836 to 1917. He created this sort of literary persona, um, the sort of a folksy kind of persona, um, and he he became known by this name. In fact, um, mo most people just know the name Mendele Mokhlov, and they don't uh, really know that his real name is uh, Sholem Yanke Vabramovich. He's considered the first writer who used Yiddish for um, modern literary uh, creativity. When he published, when he began publishing his first book in serial form in 1864, uh, Yiddish was underdeveloped as a literary language. And so he really formed a Yiddish prose style. Uh, no. I, uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, can you can you share, or I can? I can share. Okay, thank you. Um, so the the prose the the style that he developed was very influential. It influenced all uh, later writers. Uh, by the way, he also Mendele also fashioned a Hebrew prose style that was influential for decades. Um, he really presents a, a very complex and pretty unbiased picture of the Eastern European Jewish way of life. Uh, he can be very satirical, highly critical, but he, is, he presents many aspects of Jewish life. One thing that he presents that was not, it was hardly at all presented before him, was uh, depictions of nature. Jews um, are, you know, stereotypically supposed to be concerned with scholarship and with earning a living and with the family, with the home, indoors, the shtetl. And Mendele has these wonderful flowing lyrical descriptions of nature, of rivers and forests, um, and birds and animals. And, and uh, it's just, uh, he was really the first Yiddish writer to, to start describing these, these things in Yiddish. Um, his work um, it is really a response to three earlier movements in Jewish culture. Uh, the, the Enlightenment, which was very rationalistic, uh, very uh, practical, sort of believing in progress and everything, you know, we're progressing. Um, Hasidism, which in many ways was... Uh, the Enlightenment was a response to Hasidism in many ways, and so the, that mystical, um, well, there are many things one can say about Hasidism, but uh, uh, sort of folksy, populist uh, kind of movement. And the Misnagdim, the rationalist, uh, skeptical movement that countered Hasidism. And Mendele tried to present another option, um, of another way of describing Jewish life. Um, first, person, first person narrative is really the hallmark of his writing. One day I, Mendele the bookseller, was driving my horse and wagon along the river and 
And so it, it's really a marvelous <coughs> combination. His writing is a combination of everyday scenes and traditional motifs and irony and sometimes sarcasm that's, and satire that's aimed at encouraging uh, social reform because he too felt that Jewish life needed to change. The second of the Drei Klassikers um, is um, Sholom Rabinovich, whose pen name is Sholom Aleichem. And of course, he borrowed that from the <coughs> common Yiddish greeting, Sholom Aleichem. And we just heard about his, his epitaph. Uh, he, he's considered uh, a very, you know, great Jewish author and humorist, but uh, he's known for his humor, although his own life was not that humorous. Uh, they like to call him, uh, in the last, last century, in the 20th century, he was, uh, he was known as the Yiddish Mark Twain, which is really a misnomer. I mean, it's not, it was a way, I guess, of making him more accessible to uh, American readers. Now, what's, uh, his writing is really, um, includes a lot of the intonations of, uh, of everyday Yiddish conversation. It's very conversational. When he reproduces speech, uh, it's very, um, it it's, comes alive. He wrote novels and plays, but he's um, perhaps best known for his um, confe fictional confessions, letters, and monologues written in the voice of a simple Jew. He has a series, uh, many of you are probably familiar, he has a series of stories called The Railroad Stories, the Eisenbahn Geschichtes, and those, he opens those stories by, uh, he presents himself as a traveling salesman, and he says, one day I'm on the train from A to B, and I'm sitting there, and all I want to do is just sleep, but these people behind me are talking, and this is what they're saying. And we get a whole story, and there's very little comment on the part of the narrator. He just, he's just, oh me, I'm just a, I'm just a pipeline, you know. I'm, this is what I heard. This is what they said. Um, and he, uh, he sometimes presented, he presented himself, you know, the, the authorial Shalom Aleichem, me, Shalom Aleichem. Um, I heard this, so obviously this, this really happened. This is what they really said. So he's the intermediary between his readers and his characters. And this is the real thing, because I, Shalom Aleichem, heard it. Of course, Shalom Aleichem is a fiction. <laughs> But I, Sholem Aleichem, heard this, so obviously it happened. And of course, his, uh, probably his most famous protagonist is uh, Tevye der Milchikel, mm -hmm. um, the basis for the show and the film Fiddler on a Roof, which is, um, uh, you know, it's a magnificent show. It's very, it's all, uh, you know, light and sound and joy and dancing and so on. But in actual fact, uh, Tevye's family life and his, all his economic schemes are really miserable failures. So, Sholm Aleichem is, he's considered a comic writer because there's a lot of humor in his writing, but there's certainly a darkness to his work. He was also a, a very important advocate of Yiddish writing. In the late 1880s, he founded and subsidized an annual journal um, called the Yiddish Volksbibliothek, the Jewish Popular Library, Again, playing on Yiddish and you know, language, language and, and uh, people. And so that was an annual journal that published the works of the most important writers of that period. And it was thanks to him that many writers uh, first began uh, being published. He was very popular during his lifetime. He gave public readings all over Europe um, and in the United States where he... Uh, where he died because he got uh, stuck during the war in 1916. Um, assimilated the influences of his great, uh, the, the non-Jewish contemporaries in Russia and in Western Europe. He was the most intellectual and the most cosmopolitan of the three classic writers. They were all near contemporaries. Sholm Aleichem died in 1916, uh, Peretz died in 1915, Mendele Moichos Forum was the longest lived died in 1917, but in the uh, sort of chronology of Yiddish writing, Mendele is considered the grandfather and Sholem Aleichem is considered the son 
and Felix is considered the grandson in this uh, curious chain of, of uh, uh, sort of the generations. Felix's short stories and sketches really present a, um, a new literary aesthetic in Yiddish literature. Um, his stories have a lot of symbolism, a lot of psychological realism, which was missing from Mendel Emoichel's poems and Sholem Aleichem's work. But he does it very cleverly. He presents folk materials in a literary form. And he combines sort of romantic and satiric elements in the same work. And so, so a lot of his work is, uh, 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 much of his work is, is parody that suggests conflict between tradition and modernity. And so he really led the way for modernist Yiddish writers. His work is very complex. Uh, it's, uh, in, in, it's deceptively uh, folksy and romantic. But when you read Pellet, you, you realize that there's something more and it's, it's elusive. Um, and there haven't been very many literary studies of Pellet, I think, because of, because of this, because you can't quite pin him down. He became the major Yiddish cultural personality in pre-war Warsaw, and Warsaw was the largest Jewish city in the world. And it had the largest Jewish population. I, I don't have the numbers, but um, he, so people, there are stories of, of uh, you know, aspiring uh, Yiddish writers, Hebrew writers uh, from the provinces who would uh, scrape together a few pennies, buy a train ticket, take a bundle of papers, and knock on Peretz's door. Uh, and uh, he would open the door, and he uh, published many young Yiddish writers, and so he was really the, uh, the facilitator of much of early 20th century Yiddish literature. Uh, we were talking in here earlier about, about uh, Jewish funerals and epitaphs. Uh, Peretz's funeral in Warsaw was one of the <coughs> largest mass demonstrations that it was ever seen in, in, uh, in, uh, in Warsaw in 1915. Um, now, um, they, they were mainly prose writers, although all uh, poets certainly did write poetry. But at the turn of the 20th century, Yiddish poets became uh, very, um, they came to the forefront of Yiddish modernism. And they adopted European models of romantic and symbolist Russian and German lyrical poetry. And here's where the, um, the openness of Yiddish and the fact that these writers were all working in Europe where they had to be familiar with different languages. And so Yiddish writers in Europe knew many of them, those who lived in Russia knew Russian, those who lived uh, in Western, more westerly Europe knew German, uh, many knew French, those who lived in Poland knew Polish. And so they were all, they could enjoy uh, all those literatures and, their in, and incorporated many of those influences. Uh, but of course, after the First World War, the traditional life of <coughs> Eastern Europe, Jews and non-Jews, that, all that began to disintegrate. Uh, there, there were uh, internal migrations to the cities, overseas migrations, mainly to America, wars, revolutions, persecutions, everything there, everything was in upheaval in Europe. And European Yiddish writers were caught up in these population migrations and in the uh, cultural trends of the interwar periods. And those, uh, of course, included the various forms of modernism with a capital M. Everyone was uh, looking for new forms of linguistic expression, poetic expression, to convey the new experiences. And so Yiddish writers broke with the traditional forms, um, free rhythm, radical avant-garde poetry, prose fiction that, that can be violent and shocking. There was this, this thing of we have to, obviously the First World War was such a terrible event that nothing after the, it was called the Great War, remember? Nothing after the Great War is going to be the same or should be the same as it was before the Great War. And so we need new forms of expression. This was common all over Europe. Um, at the same time, Yiddish writers um, were really afflicted by an intense nostalgia for the old way of life. Maybe more than non-Jewish writers. 
Uh, but um, many, many non-Jewish writers also had these feelings of disaffection from the old, but alienation from the new. What, what kind of new should I choose? Can, maybe I could, should make up my own new. Uh, and people felt adrift, and uh, Yiddish writers were, were right in the middle of all of that. By the 1930s, Yiddish literature was as modernist as any Western literature. Any of the Western literatures, it was fully was a full-fledged modernist literature. And um, it was in Poland that uh, the modern secular Jewish culture was strongest. And uh, the center was Warsaw. In 1906, in Warsaw, there were five daily Yiddish newspapers. There was a combined readership of nearly 100,000 readers, Yiddish readers for, daily, for a daily newspaper. The most important newspaper, which was uh, called Heinz today, started repr reprinting, reprinting Yiddish fiction in serial form. So hundreds of thousands of readers could, be, could become familiar with works written in their own language through the newspaper. And they also made classic European literature accessible through translations into Yiddish. And so many Yiddish readers first became familiar with the work of Balzac, Dickens, Chekhov, through these translations in the daily newspapers. Um, I'm going to um, mention one of, the, one of the major, in fact, uh, the preeminent Yiddish poet of the interwar period, Peretz Malkish. Peretz Malkish was an amazing poet. Um, who started writing in Poland, and uh, together with, uh, he was a member of a, of a radical avant-garde group that uh, really uh, flouted convention, and uh, at the very name they gave themselves was sort of in your face, the Chaliastre, the gang. Now, who, how can you take seriously a group of writers that titles itself the gang? But that's what they were called, and they published their first, uh, that was, this was uh, Peretz Malkish, together with Uri Tzvi Greenberg and Melech Ravich. They published their first literary journal in Warsaw in 1922. Uh, Malkish had served in the, second, in the First World War, so had Uri Tzvi Greenberg. Their experiences were, really marked them for life. And the Chaliastre was a Jewish version of uh, expressionism the expressionist trend in modern literature, which was very powerful in Europe after the First World War. And so they, they Markish and, and the other writers used, they, their syntax was completely fractured. They used a lot of exclamation points, free rhythms, no metrical beats, surrealistic images, erotic allusions. So lot of hidden, you know, instead. We don't, we don't write such things in Yiddish, but they did. And even and uh, leftist war cries against war, against you know, for the revolution. Uh, Peretz Malkish was really the most remarkable of these poets. He uh, he 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 bends the language almost out of recognition, and it, it's really a very very unusual, very uh, very important poet. Uh, there, he, he didn't actually found a school of writing because he was so original and so um, his own person that he it didn't lend in, his writing didn't lend itself to imitation. Um, New York became a major center of Yiddish literature, um, especially of poetry. Between about 1890 and 1971, there were five major groups of Yiddish poets in the, in, on the East Coast in succession. Again, there's this thing of a lineage, a uh, sort of a chronology. The earliest of these groups of, poem, of poets were known as the sweatshop poets. And they reflected the immigrant experience in very spirited rhetoric. A lot of them were left-wingers and socialists, and they were often uh, revolutionary in, in the way they wrote. Um, they were followed by a group that had an, uh, that as artists were sort of 
a backlash to the sweatshop poets. The sweatshop poets were very socially involved. The, fo the group that followed them, the young ones, the Junge, that published its first magazine in 1907, they were interested in art for art's sake, aesthetics, and they wrote impressionist verse, focusing on the experiences of the individual, not uh, for society, not uh, calling for revolution, but rather um, turning inward. And among these poets were outstanding figures such as Moshe Leib Halpern um, and Anna Margolin. And we, we talked about Anna Margolin uh, in, the, in the workshop uh, earlier here today. Anna Margolin uh, produced only one book of poetry. She immediately became very prominent uh, through her, because of her radical poetry. One of the things that was uh, shocking for the time and still is very remarkable is the way she bends gender in her poems. One of the first poems, is it the first poem, Nomi? I, once I was a youth, and this is written by Anna, Man, Anna Margolin, who's, which is also a pen name, but here's a woman right, starting off a poem by saying, once I was a youth, and then she moves into uh, ancient Rome. This is Yiddish poetry, and, but it's terrific poetry. She was a master, um, she was at, at, in, in poetry um, at creating half rhymes and partial rhymes. She, she felt that full rhyme was too, um, too boring, too predictable, so she went into half rhymes and slant rhymes and she felt that was more unsettling and would make the reader sit up and take notice. Um, the third group of New York poets were called the introspectivists, and they um, rebelled against, against the aestheticism of the Junge. The Junge wanted aesthetics, art for art's sake. The introspectivists published a journal that was titled In Sich, In Sich, In the Self, In Oneself, and that became a major force of modern literature for decades. One of the major figures was the poet Jankiv Gladstein, poet and prose writer. And he uh, wrote in free verse, very open language, very few um, um, conformist poets. Gladstein was a master of the language. He often employed very sophisticated wordplay. And many of his po poems focused on the life and the situation of Jews in the world. In 1934, 20 years after he came to the United States, Gladstein traveled back to Europe to visit his mother, who was very ill. He wrote two novels, two autobiographical novels after this visit. One, the first one is When Yash Left, when Yash is the phone from the United States, and the second is when Yash is the Kumen, when Yash arrived. Yash, by the way, is a nickname that's uh, a nickname for Yankiv, uh, the Jewish, the Yiddish form of, of Jacob. Now, both these novels, written in 1934, 1935, um, have a very, very strong sense of impending doom. He was. He has in Venyashi's the phone. Um, he's on a train in Europe on his way to uh, his mother's home in Lublin, and the novel, by the way, ends with the conductor calling out the name Lublin. Mm -hmm. We don't know what happens in Lublin. Venyash is the Kumin. The second volume starts with him in a, uh, I guess, a, a vacation home after the death of his mother. We don't actually find out what actually happened in Lublin. But um, on that train, he meets up with a German soldier. And this is 1934. And so it's, uh, without being too overt, it's very, very clear to him, and he conveys to us what is going to happen. Um, prose writers, 
Other prose writers, such as the two brothers, those two great brothers of, in Yiddish literature, Israel Joshua Singer and Isaac Basheva Singer, uh, started their literary careers in Poland and continued them in New York. Uh, Israel Joshua I.J. Singer was the older brother. He was a well-established writer in Poland and then immigrated to New York and became well-established in New York and sent for his younger, younger brother Yitzchok, uh, who's, uh, who later adopted the, the matronymic Bashevis. Basheva, he, he adopted his mother's name Basheva. And uh, Bashevis is a, is a possessive, so, and that's uh, probably uh, ground for a very uh, interesting investigation why he chose his mother's name to be known by Bashevis. Um, anyway, Bashevis came to New York at, um, after uh, IJ was, was there, and uh, IJ Singer is uh, often considered to be actually the better writer of the two brothers. Is, uh, I.J. Singer's masterwork is the novel The Brothers Ashkenazi, Die Brüder Ashkenazi, it, which was written in the early 1930s. It, it uh, opens a broad panorama of the Eastern European Jewish experience of the late 19th and early 20th century. Now, it's very ambitious, but he does it. It's a, it's a novel about Lodz, which was the uh, major Jewish city in Poland and the center of the textile industry. And he starts, he starts with the German settlers who followed, um, who after, um, who, who settled in Poland in the Lodz area and brought their weaving implements with them, who started the textile industry in Lodz. And then goes on to describe how the Jews started and all, all the way through all um, modernization, the industrial age, everything that, that, affected, that, that affected Europe at that time. But he critiques this experience pretty strongly as well. It's a marvelous read. It's very much in the, in the tradition of the great family sagas like, uh, you know, the uh, Woodenbrooks and... Uh, um, even war and peace, because war comes into the experiences in Lodz. There's a German occupation, there's a Russian occupation. Now, his younger brother, of, uh, Isaac uh, Yitzchok Bashevi Singel, uh, became famous by, he, by, because uh, he employed uh, themes of witchcraft and mystery and legend in his stories. He's a marvelous writer, but he didn't have the same breadth of vision as his older brother. He draws on traditional sources. Um, Bashevis's fiction is also con uh, concerned with the, the bizarre, the grotesque, female uh, homosexuality, transvestism, demons. Um, he became very well known in the United States because, uh, thanks to English translations of his work. He had a very good sense of what was needed to survive and flourish in the United States, so he um, he started having, getting his works translated and, uh, which, and they were, uh, aroused a lot of interest because of these um, un-Jewish so-called themes, uh, transvestism, demons. Um, and Bashevis Singer was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1978 and that was interpreted as the long overdue legitimation of Yiddish literature. Finally, Yiddish literature had arrived, had taken its place among the literature of, of the nations. Um, let's go back to Europe. In the early 1920s, Berlin was a focal point for many European artists and artistic trends, uh, and this included Yiddish writers. The fiction writer David Bergelson uh, lived in uh, Berlin for over a decade. There were many uh, Hebrew writers, who lived in Germany, uh, Yiddish writers, Russian writers. It was really a very, very interesting place in, in the 20s. Uh, Bergelson produced some of his finest work in Berlin. He, his fiction is impressionistic. He uses internal monologue, uh, multiple perspectives, nonlinear narratives. His narratives go back and forth in flashbacks and odd uh, perspectives. And he's generally considered the, the best of the interwar prose writers because he was so uh, remarkable. 
Now, Bergelson uh, returned to the USSR in 1933, when Hitler came to power, and he joined other Yiddish poets and prose writers, who, including Makish, who returned, many of them returned to the USSR during, in the late 20s. But of course, in the 30s, the Jewish intellectuals and artists were becoming more and more repressed and persecuted. Uh, even those who sort of compromised their art artistic integrity in order to conform to the official communist line, they always remain suspect. And we know, of course, that uh, in, on August 12, 1952, 13 Jewish intellectuals, in, um, including uh, writers, actors, musicians, artists, were executed by Stalin's orders. Six of the 13 were major Yiddish authors, including Peretz Malkish and David Bedelson. And that event has become known as the Night of the Murdered Poets. During the Second World War in Europe, Yiddish culture was a form of resistance in the conditions of the ghettos. Most of the work produced by ghetto writers was destroyed, but we know that they, they, there was constant production, constant activity. There were, we know there were theater shows and music and, of course, schools, and there, there's a, a lot of information. It's been documented pretty well. Uh, some poets, such as Sutzkevel, whom we mentioned, um, survived and um, have tried to express the, the inexpressible destruction. Uh, Suskevel, by the way, um, was, lived in Palestine and Israel. He was not a Zionist ideologue, but he did embrace his new country and its landscapes and experiences and incorporated them in his Yiddish work. Uh, over the decades of his life in Israel, Sutzkevel produced a very large body of poetry and prose. He, had, he lived more, more years in Israel than he did in Europe. Uh, and he managed to blend his different worlds in a, in a masterly Yiddish. He's really a fantastic writer. Um, another um, interesting place where Yiddish literature was produced was uh, Palestine by Zionist settlers who continued to write in Yiddish. Uh, although Yiddish, uh, of course, was, was considered uh, emblematic of the ex exilic existence that Zionism wanted to overturn and replace by a Hebrew culture that would be the, the antithesis of Yiddish, of, uh, Yid of exilic existence, uh, and so, and most European Zionist immigrants whose mother tongue was Yiddish, in fact, did switch to Hebrew and discouraged their children from using Yiddish. Uh, thankfully, my parents were not among them. <laughs> not that I didn't use Yiddish, but my parents continued to speak Yiddish among themselves while they were, um, you know, fervent Zionists and, and Hebraists, but um, they spoke Yiddish and Hebrew at home. Um, some Yiddish writers um, began producing texts in Palestine for an audience that wanted literature in its mameloshin. And so uh, between 1928 and 1939, 19 collections, literary collections in Yiddish were published in Palestine. Um, these were not regular magazines, they were more like one-time publications. But obviously there was an audience, and so these collections began, uh, kept on being published sometimes once a year, twice a year, every, uh, after 18 months in different parts of Palestine. And uh, the, the poetry and, po and prose that appeared in these collections is very interesting because it's a sort of blends Europe and Palestine into a whole new experience and culture. The Second World War and the Holben, the destruction, caused a, a dramatic, very sudden drop in the use of Yiddish all over the world. The communities, uh, Jewish communities that used Yiddish were almost completely extinguished. Uh, but immediately after liberation by the Allies, the survivors began to try and retrieve writings that had been produced in the ghettos and had been hidden by a variety of, of means. Uh, some of them were put in glass jars and metal strong boxes in the, in the earth. 
Some were given to trustworthy uh, non-Jews and uh, were handed back. And then memoirs began to appear, um, as well as powerful poetry. Uh, but today, most of these writers are quite elderly, and there are few younger writers in Yiddish. When um, Jews from the former Soviet Union began moving out of the Soviet Union, uh, it turned out that very few of them actually knew Yiddish uh, because of Soviet policy. Uh, so there are not many younger writers or young, youngish writers in Yiddish today. So today, um, Yiddish survives as an everyday spoken language almost exclusively in communities of Orthodox Jews all over the world. However, there is still a broad network of Yiddish secular schools in parts of Central and South America, as I mentioned in Mexico and Argentina mainly. Two of the uh, um, Yiddish scholars at the Hebrew University are products of uh, Mexico and Argentina. Uh, but one of them has retired. Chava Tolniansky uh, from Mexico City retired a few years ago. Uh, Avrom Novostel, who these days is the moving force behind Yiddish in Israel, uh, is, well, he's not thinking of retirement yet, but uh, he's, you know, uh, he's the major person. And um, um, so what happens now is that Yiddish language and literature are more and more becoming topics of academic study, um, study that the, in the universities, but the, that secular Jewish culture of the interwar period which was so exuberant and so lively and so innovative, that really has no continuation. And there are no real heirs to that. Secular Yiddish culture today consists of uh, small circles, large circles, clubs, reading groups all over the world. Uh, Paris is one major center of, of Yiddish culture and of Yiddish scholarship. Um, mentioned, uh, who mentioned Nibolsky? Uh, Professor Yitzchok Nibolsky, who also, by the way, is a project of Ar Argentina. Uh, New York is another center. Uh, Israel is experiencing a resurgence of popular, popular interest in Yiddish. Uh, there's a Hebrew magazine on, on Yiddish, on everything Yiddish, uh, is appearing in, uh, appears in Tel Aviv twice a year. It's titled, interestingly, uh, Dafke. <laughs> that untranslatable Yiddish term, which is also used in Hebrew in the same sense. And uh, so that's titled Dafke, and it appears twice a year. Um, some people from UC Berkeley are among the contributors to Dafke. It's written in Hebrew. So there's uh, hopefully an increasing number of people, of Hebrew readers who are interested enough in Yiddish to, uh, to get that um, uh, periodical. Uh, and Yiddish classes in Tel Aviv are swamped with students. Now, it's an interesting, I think, sociological topic to see, to figure out how much of this is sort of nostalgia for a world that these students never knew. Um, and it's the same, I think, often in the Yiddish groups in the United States. Uh, we're, we're talking about third or fourth generation immigrants who become passionately interested in the world of their great grandparents and learn Yiddish. But uh, how many of them actually live their lives in Yiddish is debatable, if, if at all. And the best measure of that is that the Yiddish newspapers and periodicals are all struggling to survive with tiny, tiny readerships, and uh, Trishman knows about that. Uh, the Forward, which was once just one of New York's thriving Yiddish dailies and had a vast readership, now it's uh, the only one in the United States. It's not a daily, it's a weekly. It has an English like edition. What's that? How uh, many Yiddish? Orthodox. Oh, right. Well, I, uh, I, I, uh, right. Yo, absolutely. But I, I said at some point that I was going to concentrate on secular Yiddish. Um, um, the Forward, by the way, has a uh, website 
which is pretty good um, uh, in Yiddish. So you can read the Yiddish folders on, on the web. YIVO, um, uh, the Yiddish Research Institute that was founded in Vilnius, Vilnius uh, Vilna in 1925, continues its research and teaching activities in New York and runs an intensive summer program. Um, Columbia runs an intensive summer program. So does Vilna. Um, Yiddish is taught at many universities all over the world, in, including uh, Israel, England, Germany, Poland, Japan. Uh, there are um, conferences and summer sessions uh, are organized in many countries. Um, in the Bay Area, UC Berkeley has hosted seven international Yiddish conferences. Uh, there are quite a few websites. The people have uh, really uh, made, uh, are making good use of the web. There are websites and blogs and discussion groups that are devoted to Yiddish, and some are actually in Yiddish characters. Others are in transliteration. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Mendele, the site in homage to Mendele Moichos uh, If you Google M-E-N-D-E-L-E, -E -E, you'll get to that website, and it's a clearinghouse for questions like, uh, I remember two words of a lullaby my great-grandma used to sing, can anyone help me? Yeah. <laughs> and people do respond. Uh, so from that to uh, what was the name of uh, Bashevis's uh, next door neighbor? Uh, <laughs> uh, please, can anyone find in, in any of the uh, archives? Uh, the National Yiddish Book Center in Amherst collects Yiddish books from all over the world and provides a terrific service by digitizing the books. And that's, I think it's funded by uh, Steven Spielberg. That's a wonderful, wonderful service. You can get many <coughs> books free of charge uh, um, or with a nominal charge, uh, digital copies of Yiddish books. Uh, before they started that, you could, you could order books, but very often they were the very poor quality. The paper just literally came apart in your hands. If you got a, you know, a book that was published in Poland in, in 1918, it, and now we can get digital copies. And they also have a quarterly publication. That's right. Contributors. Yeah. The Packenträger. The Packenträger published in English. Um, um, now um, I'm going to uh, give a plug for UC Berkeley. That's that's where I'm from. I, t I teach Yiddish language and literature at UC Berkeley, um, and uh, other uh, scholars in UC Berkeley, and we have Naomi Seidman here. She's one of the uh, UC Berkeley scholars who are involved in other academic disciplines, are always very generous with their time and expertise on, in Yiddish matters. Um, and uh, the Berkeley community has various Yiddish groups, um, official, non-official. For a few years, I, I hosted a Yiddish reading group in my home. Uh, there's a long-standing group um, a class run through Lairhouse Judaica um, that's been going on for, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 years uh, of readers. Uh, um, I, I happen to lead that class as well, and we're always seeking out more challenging materials and, and looking for new participants. Um, and uh, some of the, some of the um, people who are active in Yiddish and now are people who learn Yiddish as, a, as adults. Uh, it is possible. You don't have to have, had, have absorbed Yiddish with your mother's milk to, to be able to, to read and enjoy Yiddish. Um, so, to conclude, more or less, um, Yiddish is sometimes considered an endangered language. I don't think it quite fits the criteria of, you know, the uh, uh, UN for the World Endangered Languages, uh, but it is considered endangered. But I have no doubt that it'll continue to survive and flourish. Uh, maybe not in a form or context that everyone will be happy with, but it is here, it survives, it flourishes, and the fact that we're all gathered here today is really uh, reaffirms this uh, conviction. Thank you. You didn't mention the other two. Oh, well. In other words, when you went to the 
Switch off the younger, the insufficient. You suspect them, and then they were too worried. That you were. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, I didn't want to get really did not want to get into too much uh, literary uh, history here. Um, let's see. Well, who followed the insufficient? Or the insufficient were the last row. I was wondering that myself. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I have to go back and look at that. Yes. We have to look that up. There was a group around with Sliva, but I don't know that they got a name. Came, came after there's a, there was a group around with Sliva, which was um, Cutting All uh, Literary Journal. Right, right. That was active after the war. Well, I was following Hal Shav's uh, chronology. Are you sure you were five? I think that's what he well, said, but I'll have to, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I, I have to go back and look it up. I, I, yeah. The Chalyastra was in Poland. The Chalyastra was not in the United States. We're talking about, uh, uh, the, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't remember. The ones that were the Inzit poets. Yes, the Inzichisten. Inzichisten. Uh... They teach Yiddish at Stanford. They te that's right. That's right. Yes. Could you repeat the uh, place? I think you said it was Amherst. Where you can get the book. Yes, the National Yiddish Book Center. If you, uh, again, if you Google that, you'll get to their Bichar. website. Bichar.org. Bichar, Bichar, but in Yiddish transliteration, so it's B-I-K-H-E-R. Go then. What? Yes. Yeah, just a comment for uh, Jewish newspapers. There is one in Israel, which is Lebensfragen or Inzerezeit, and I'm not sure what the name of it is. It goes once a month. Yes, and Lebensfragen. Yes. Yeah, so it's still mm -hmm. ongoing. Right, right. And a lot. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I know a Bissel, a very Bissel, okay. of Yiddish. But there are like certain expressions that I remember my grandfather or you know my grandmother would say. And then when I would talk to friends that were not Jewish and try to translate what it means, it's like, you know, there's there's no way to translate some of these expressions yeah. in Yiddish. And why is that? I well, you know, I'd like every, every, any language, yeah. any language has its own context. If you say, you know, the English phrase, go the whole nine yards. Oh, Tell that to someone <laughs> who's not familiar with the context. What are you talking about? What is the context? What is the context? I think it's football. No, no, the whole nine yards has to do with letting out the sale. The sale. That's right. No space sale. I thought it was football, which I know absolutely nothing about, so I sort of automatically assumed that it's... Okay, so there you are. It comes from the time, the day of sailing ships. And who in the world knows anything about, uh, you know, sailing terminology? Official. Official. <laughs> By the way, I think you ought to give a plug to some of the events that are going on here. Uh, Naomi is going to be giving a lecture at Stanford this coming Wednesday right. evening in English, right. and then at Stanford in Yiddish. Uh, the, the following, the following day, day, yeah. Well, I think they, uh, they are we going to be talking about the Gospel of Matthew in Yiddish. Ah, really? Yeah. Yeah. A very Jewish subject. <laughs> well, Matthew was Jewish, wasn't he? Apparently. Matis Yohu. Matis Yohu. There you go, like the uh, <laughs> reggae uh, singer. I ought to also mention the Besura Taiva Loit Matthew. Other and uh, the book itself is called the Brisk Hadasha. Mm -hmm. I ought to also mention the, the fact book, that uh, our uh, group is the International Association of Yiddish Clubs is having its conference April 23rd to 26th uh, over at the Western Hotel in Milbright. And uh, there are 100 Yiddish clubs in the United States, Canada, Spain, Israel, and South Africa that will be sending representatives there. And we have speakers from Japan from Mexico and Canada that will be speaking. It's open to everybody, just like this conference. Of course, it's an international conference. And uh, the whole idea of Yiddish is completely changed because not only what happened over in Israel and in Europe, but also what's happening on the Internet. And so this virtual shtetl, which is on the uh, uh, online now, so that instead of having people living in your own neighborhood, you can communicate with people all over the world and uh, the, you can go on to such things as uh, the uh, Facebook and other areas like that, blogging, Twitter, 
and you can have these Yiddish communications. It's not the same as being right there. You can send but a blitz post. In Israel, for example, there are 57 high schools that are teaching Yiddish as a second language. Wow. Yiddish is being taught in uh, not only in Hebrew University and in Tel Aviv University, but also to a greater extent than either one of those in Bar Ilan, where there are 10 Yiddish teachers who are teaching the courses. So Bar Ilan is the largest Yiddish program in, uh, in Israel. So uh, the fastest growing area of Yiddish in the world is in Israel. Mm -hmm. No question about it. What's that? Ben Gurion University in Israel. What about it? David Roskin. David yes. Right. And that's that's very very significant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In Barilon, Barilon's in Northern Orthodox. What? So thank you all for uh, being so patient. <laughs> Thank you.